So hello, and uh, thank you for joining our webinar today, which is sponsored by the Access Forum. My name is Anastasia Papas, and I'm the director of uh, the forum. Today is a rather special webinar, um, as it is the first one in our effort to, to highlight and promote uh, the research of uh, prominent young economists uh, who work on uh, climate economics. We will resume our regular webinar structure on April 11th, when we will start a new thematic uh, sequence uh, on the impact of uh, climate change and um, climate change mitigation policies on inflation. So the first webinar uh, of this uh, three webinar series will be on April 11th. And the speaker is Miles Parker uh, from ECB. But back to today, we are very happy to have as a speaker, uh, Diego Kenzi, uh, prominent young economist uh, who will um, present his uh, paper on the unequal economic consequences of um, carbon pricing. Uh, this is actually one of the very few papers uh, that uh, analyze the impact of uh, carbon taxes on uh, inequality. And um, for this paper, Diego uh, was awarded the ECB's uh, Young Economist Prize in uh, 2021. Uh, Diego is currently completing his PhD at uh, the London Business School. And in September, he's joining the economics department at uh, Northwestern University as a college fellow. And then in 2023, as an assistant professor. But before I pass the floor to Diego, um, I would like to remind you uh, to post your questions on the chat function and also invite you to answer our short um, survey. So the first question is, do you expect climate policy to increase uh, inequality? And the second question is, uh, through which channels could carbon pricing increase inequality? So just a few seconds for everyone to have the chance to respond. Okay, so 56% of you think that it, it will indeed increase, uh, um, it will primarily increase along existing inequalities. 29%, uh, um, it will increase inequality, but climate policy will primarily create new inequalities. Um, and for the second question, oh, the majority of you, 74%, think that the increase of inequality would come through higher energy inflation. And more or less uh, uh, split between whether um, the inequality will come about through higher general inflation or lower growth rates. So I think Diego can enlighten us. Um, and, uh, so the, um, the floor is yours, Diego. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Anastasia, for having me and for this kind introduction. I'm very excited uh, to talk about the unequal economic consequences of carbon pricing in today's EXIS uh, webinar series. Let me share my slides. Can you see my slides and can you see them moving? Okay. So the looming climate crisis has put climate change at the top of the global policy agenda. And indeed there is urgent need for climate action as emphasized by the most recent IPCC report. Carbon pricing policies are increasingly used as a tool to mitigate climate change all over the world, 
However, because these policies haven't been in place for that long, still relatively little is known about their effects in practice. Is carbon pricing effective at reducing emissions? What is the impact on output, employment, and inflation? And most importantly, who bears the economic cost of these policies? I think these questions are particularly relevant also given the tragic events that happen are happening now in Ukraine and the situation on electricity and gas markets and growing concern about energy poverty more broadly. In this paper, I present new evidence on these questions uh, from the European Emissions Trading Scheme, short EU ETS, which is the largest and also oldest major carbon market in the world. I will exploit institutional features of this market in combination with high frequency financial data to estimate the aggregate and distributional consequences of carbon pricing. The UETS is a cap and trade system. So unlike a carbon tax, which directly regulates the price, the quantity is regulated. So there is a cap on overall emissions covered by the system. And within this cap, emission allowances are allocated and then traded. Therefore, there exists a market price for carbon and importantly, there also exist liquid futures markets. Now, establishing the EUETS was a process, and the regulations in this market have changed considerably over time. It is exactly these two observations that motivate my identification design. And the idea is to isolate some exogenous variation in the carbon price by measuring how carbon futures prices change in a tight window around regulatory policy events concerning the supply of emission allowances. And in the next step, I use this as an instrument to estimate the dynamic causal effects of a structural carbon policy shock. Let me give you a preview of my main results. I find that carbon pricing has significant effects on both emissions and the economy. A shock tightening the carbon pricing regime leads to a significant increase in energy prices, a persistent fall in emissions, and an uptick in green innovation. So this is the positive. However, this does not come without a cost. Economic activity falls, at least temporarily, and consumer prices increase actually quite persistently. Importantly, these costs are not borne equally across society. Using detailed household level data, I document that poor households lower their consumption significantly and persistently, while richer households are much less affected. And it turns out that not only are the poor more exposed because of their higher energy expenditure share, this is one of the standard channels that people have in mind, I also find that they face a stronger fall in their income and these indirect effects via income and employment turn out to play a crucial role in the consumption of the policy. Interestingly, it turns out that the falling incomes are not concentrated in sectors with the highest energy intensity, but in more demand sensitive sectors. And these are also the sectors where poor households predominantly work. A current policy shock leading to an increase in the energy price essentially acts like a tax. To the extent that energy demand is inelastic, this reduces the disposable income of households available for expenditure other than energy. And to the extent that poor households have a higher energy expenditure share, which is the case because energy is a necessity good, they are disproportionately affected. However, this fall in non-energy expenditure ultimately causes a fall in aggregate demand. And this has consequences for the labor market as well, where I find that the unemployment rate increases and wages fall. This initiates a second round of effects that again disproportionately affect poor households because their incomes turn out to be more sensitive to these changes in the labor market, causing their income and expenditure to fall by even more, initiating a powerful amplification mechanism that ultimately causes a much sharper disruption in economic activity. And my results suggest that these indirect effects may be quantitatively even more important than these direct effects via energy prices. In fact, my estimates suggest that these indirect effects can account for about 80% of the aggregate effect on consumption, while the direct effects only make up for around 20%. And finally, I develop a climate economy model that features heterogeneity in households' energy expenditure shares, income incidence, and marginal propensities to consume, 
And I show that the model with these ingredients is able to account for the empirical facts that I document. And in this framework, I also show that by redistributing some of the carbon revenues to the most affected low-income households, one can reduce the economic costs of carbon pricing and mitigate the inequality impacts without compromising emission reductions to a significant extent. All right, after this brief introduction, let's jump right into the paper. And let me start by giving you some more detail about the identification design. As I've mentioned, I exploit institutional features of the European carbon market. This market was established in 2005. It covers around 40% of overall EU greenhouse gas emissions, mainly in the power and heavy emitting industrial sectors. It is a cap and trade system. So there is a cap on total emissions covered by the system. And to ensure that emissions fall over time, this cap is reduced each year. Within this cap, emission allowances, short EUA, are allocated and there are different means of doing so. In particular, during the first years of the system, most of these allowances were allocated for free. It was probably just a politically feasible way. But later on, auctioning became the default way of allocating these allowances. And currently more than half of the allowances are actually auctioned off. At the end of each year, the companies covered by the system must surrender sufficient allowances to cover their yearly emissions. And this is enforced with heavy fines. Allowances are traded on secondary markets and there exist both spot and futures markets doing so, but the majority of the action really takes place in these futures markets. So to fix ideas, um, if a company is short of emission allowances at the end of a given year, it can buy these extra allowances on these markets. On the other hand, if a company managed to reduce emissions by more than it anticipated, it can sell the spare allowances at a profit or it can keep them for future use. The establishment of the EU ETS did not happen overnight. It was more of a learning by doing process. The system was established in three main phases, but even within these phases, the rules have been updated continuously, for instance, to address issues encountered in this market to expand the coverage of the system, both in terms of sectors and gases, or to improve market efficiency. So the bottom line here is there is lots of regulatory events in this market. In this chart, you can see the evolution of the carbon price over the three phases of the system that I will consider in this paper. What I want you to take away from this chart is that there was quite a bit of variation in this price and this is exactly what I'm going to exploit for identification. I should mention that at the end of phase one, the price converged to zero. And this was because in this first trial phase, allowances couldn't be brought over to the second phase. But later on, these allowances became storable and uh, we wouldn't observe this behavior any longer. In the next step, I collected a comprehensive list of regulatory update events. This can take the form of a decision of the European Commission, a vote by the European Parliament, or a judgment of a European court. Of key interest in this paper are regulatory news concerning the supply of emission allowances. Uh, just to give you a few examples, um, there were a couple of events that actually changed the overall cap or the rate at which the cap is reduced, uh, but these were relatively few. So I also use a lot of events concerning the free allocation of allowances. For instance, during the first years of the system, the countries covered by the system had to submit national allocation plans to the commission. The commission had to approve them. Sometimes there were also legal conflicts about them. So these are all events that I'm going to exploit. Later on, when auctioning became the default way of allocating these allowances, there are lots of events regarding the timing and the quantities to be auctioned. And finally, there are also a limited number of events concerning the use and entitlement of international credits. These are uh, kind of offsets that can also be used in exchange for uh, EU emission allowances. Going through the official journal of the European Union, I was able to identify 113 relevant events in the period from 2005 to 2018. Based on these events, the idea is then to isolate a series of carbon policy surprises by measuring the change in the EOA futures price in a tight window around the respective regulatory policy event. So to fix ideas, these surprises are computed as the percentage change in the uh, 
settlement price of the UA front contract on the event day uh, relative to the last trading day before the event. So I'm using a daily event window here. But ultimately, I'm interested in the impacts on variables that are only available at the monthly frequency. So to this end, I aggregate these daily surprises to a monthly series as follows. This is one standard way of doing in the event study literature. However, the results do not turn out to be sensitive to the particular method of aggregation. In this chart, you can see the resulting carbon policy surprise series. And we can immediately see that some of these events led to quite massive changes in the carbon price. For instance, in April 2013, uh, the price was sent down uh, in excess of 40% when the European Parliament voted against the Commission's backloading proposal. So to give you a bit of context, uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, emissions in Europe fell by quite a bit because of the subsequent recession. But this was not reflected in the way the caps were set in this European carbon market. So over the years, an oversupply of emission allowances accumulated and the Commission wanted to address this by postponing, by backloading the auctioning of new allowances. But in the first instance, the Parliament voted against this proposal. Only later on, it accepted a modified version and paved the way for higher carbon prices in Europe, as we also observe them today. I also perform a number of other diagnostic checks uh, on this uh, surprise series. It turns out that this series is uh, not serially correlated and also not forecastable by past macroeconomic or financial variables. So I hope I could convince you that this carbon policy surprise series has some good properties. However, I will still argue that it is only an imperfect shock measure. Uh, for instance, uh, because I did not capture all the relevant events or it may be measured with error because of microstructure noise in the futures market. So I won't use it as a direct shock measure, but I will use it as an external instrument to estimate the dynamic causal effects on the variables of interest following an approach that has become quite influential in empirical macroeconomics that was developed by Stock and Watson and Mertens and Braun. And the idea is basically when you have a noisy measure of a structural shock, you can use this to uh, identify the dynamic causal effects of this shock, provided that this instrument here denoted by C is correlated with the shock of interest that you want to identify but uncorrelated with all other structural shocks. So these are basically the standard uh, IV identifying assumptions just generalized to this dynamic context. For estimation, I rely on VAR techniques because of the short sample, it is quite challenging to estimate uh, these effects without some uh, form of shrinkage and the VAR is one way to get this. My baseline specification includes eight variables with euro area data consisting of a carbon block, which includes the energy component of the harmonized consumer price index and total greenhouse gas emissions, and a macro block, which includes headline consumer prices, industrial production, the unemployment rate, policy rate, the stock market index, and the real effective exchange rate. Are there any questions up to this point? So if not, and uh, we can now move uh, to the fun part and I can show you some results. But before we go there, as in any IV analysis, we have to look at the first stage first. And to this end, I perform a weak instrument test. The corresponding F statistic is around 21. This is larger than the respective critical value. And therefore we find no evidence for weak instrument problems. And I proceed by conducting standard inference. In this figure, you can see the input responses to a carbon policy shock normalized to increase the energy price by 1% on impact. We can see that a shock tightening the carbon policy regime leads to a significant increase in energy price and the persistent fall in emissions. Thus, the policy turns out to be successful at achieving its goal of reducing emissions. However, this does not come without consequence. Headline consumer prices also increase significantly. And industrial production falls, at least temporarily. The unemployment rate rises. Interestingly, it turns out that the fall in emissions though is almost estimated to be permanent, while the fall in activity is much more transitory. 
implying that the emissions intensity improves in the longer term. And in fact, I have some additional evidence that I hope I will be able to cover later on in the pre presentation that speaks to this when I look at the effect of these shocks on innovation, where I find a significant uh, uptick in the patenting activity in green technologies. Monetary policy turns out to largely look through uh, the inflationary pressures of this shock. Uh, stock prices tend to fall on impact, but then rebound relatively quickly. So overall, these results illustrate a trade-off between reducing emissions and thus the future costs of climate change and the costs in terms of lower economic activity today. So these results uh, show that energy prices seem to play an important role in the transmission of carbon policy. And in fact, I'm not the first paper to document this. There are other papers that have found that the pass through of these emissions cost to energy prices is almost complete. And I confirm this also in my analysis. Um, the new thing is then to look at the macroeconomic implications of this carbon policy induced change in the energy price. And as we know, energy prices, higher energy prices can have significant effects on the economy via both direct and indirect channels, as I've also illustrated in this flow chart at the very beginning of my presentation. So to get a better understanding of this, it is instructive to look at the effects on GDP and its subcomponents. And I do this using simple local projections. So here I regress basically these outcome variables on the carbon policy shock that I extract from the VAR model. I don't use here the high frequency carbon policy surprise series directly uh, because it's quite challenging to estimate these effects, especially at the quarterly frequency directly. And using the shock measure of the VAR gives you more power to isolate these impacts. And the results can be seen in these charts here. So we can see uh, after the shock, uh, real GDP also falls significantly. And by looking at the component, we can see that this is driven by a decrease in consumption and investment. And the consumption response turns out to be uh, quite significant. With regards to the magnitudes, uh, these responses are also normalized, uh, corresponding to an increase uh, by the energy price uh, by 1% on impact. So we can see that at its peak, the consumption response falls by around minus 0.5%. And this is by a magnitude larger than what can be accounted for by the direct effect via energy prices alone, which is theoretically bounded by the energy share of the economy, which is around 5 to 7% in Europe. So this is by a magnitude larger than that. And this suggests that there must be something else going on. And that these indirect effects that I mentioned that work through the labor market uh, and the impact on demand may play an important role. And to uh, dig a bit deeper and get a better understanding of this, it is instructive to look at the heterogeneous effects of the policy. And this is also interesting in itself because currently there is a big debate uh, about energy poverty in Europe, also given the current situation on energy markets. Um, so this is really crucial to better understand the inequality implications of these type of policies. And I do this by studying the heterogeneous effects of carbon pricing using household survey data. The challenge here is that household level microdata is not available at the EU level for a long enough and regular sample. So to uh, Circumvent this, I focus here on the UK where high quality microdata on income and expenditure is available. But if you're concerned about external validity, I will confirm my main results also using data for Denmark and Spain. In particular, I use data from the living costs and food survey. This is the major UK survey on household spending and provides detailed information on expenditure income and other household characteristics. Using the last 20 waves of the survey, I compile a repeated cross section. Unfortunately, the survey does not feature a panel dimension. So to be able to estimate the dynamic effects, I use a grouping estimator using normal disposable income as the grouping variable. 
and I group households into these three groups, low income households, which corresponds to the bottom 25% of the income distribution, middle income households, which correspond to the middle 50%, and high income households, which correspond to the top 25% of the income distribution. In this table, you can see some descriptive statistics on households in this survey. And what I want you to take away from this table are the statistics concerning the energy expenditure share, which is around 7% on average. It goes up to close to 10% for low-income households, but it is only about 5% for high-income households. So the energy expenditure share of low-income households is almost double the energy expenditure share of high-income households. So please bear that in mind when we look at the results coming up now. Um, here we can see the responses of household expenditures and income for the three income group that we consider. We can see that low-income houses have to lower their expenditure quite significantly and persistently. On the other hand, uh, the responses of middle and high-income households are more muted and also much less persistent. And it turns out that not only are low-income households more exposed because of their higher energy expenditure share, if you look at household income, we can also see that they face a stronger and more significant fall in their income as well. It is also interesting to look at the decomposition of different expenditure classes. So here you can see the responses of energy, non-durable goods and services, excluding energy and durables. So we can see that this falling expenditure is definitely not driven by a falling energy expenditure, actually energy Um, so the heterogeneity seems to be really driven by this non-durables excluding energy category where the heterogeneity is indeed quite stark. For durables, we also observe a bit of heterogeneity, but the responses are much less precisely estimated. So the heterogeneity really appears to be driven by these non-durables category. To get a better understanding of the role of these direct and uh, effects via the energy price and indirect effects via income, uh, it is useful to look at the cumulative change over the impulse horizon in pounds. So these numbers here can be interpreted as the overall adjustment in quarterly expenditure and income in pounds over the four-year impulse horizon after the shock. And we can see that energy expenditure increases across the board in relative terms, it increases the most for low-income households, consistent with the fact that these households have the highest energy expenditure share, even though I should acknowledge here that these uh, numbers are not very precisely estimated. But importantly, the increase in uh, energy expenditure can in no way account for the much more significant fall in non-energy expenditure, in particular for low-income households. And uh, these households at the same time also face a strong and significant fall in their income. Now, I can't establish a causal link between income and expenditure because I don't have exogenous variation in income, but it is interesting to observe that the overall magnitude of the fall in income for low-income households is comparable to the fall in their uh, total expenditure. And this is in line with the interpretation that these households tend to be uh, more financially constrained and thus exhibit kind of hand-to-mouth behavior and adjust their expenditure by much more when confronted with this significant fall in their income. The situation is very different for higher income households who also face a non-negligible fall in their income, even though it is less precisely estimated, but their expenditure adjustment turns out to be much more muted. And overall, it turns out that these direct effects via energy prices and energy expenditure can only account for about 20% of the aggregate fall in expenditure while these indirect effects by income turn out to be quantitatively much more important. And uh, accounting for these indirect effects is also important to gauge the inequality implications of the policy because the existing literature typically finds that these policies are only mildly regressive, if at all, but they usually only focus on the direct effects via energy price, which are bound to be small because as we have seen, the energy expenditure shares, they are heterogeneous, but still at a relatively small level. 
I show that when we also account for these indirect effects, policy can become quite more regressive. Based on my estimates, I find that low-income households account for about 40% of the aggregate effect on consumption, even though they account for a much smaller share in consumption in normal times, namely just about 15%. Another interesting question is then what drives the heterogeneity in the income responses that we have seen? So remember, we find a significant fall in the incomes for low-income households, whereas the responses are much less precisely estimated and also uh, in relative magnitudes less significant for higher income households. And there are two potential explanations for that. The first one could be that uh, households differ in their labor income because they work in different sectors. Um, and the second one is that there may also be difference in the income composition, for instance, because some households rely uniquely on labor income, whereas other households also have substantial sources of financial income. But uh, to understand basically the heterogeneity at the lower end, I guess the first explanation is more relevant. So let's focus on that for today. Uh, here you can see the responses of household incomes by different sectors of employment. And in particular, I look at two groups. Uh, first one is along the energy intensity of a given sector. And I group uh, sectors by there uh, into high and uh, sectors with a high and the lower energy intensity. And interestingly, it turns out that there is not that much heterogeneity along this dimension. In fact, the response of household incomes turns out to be comparable in high uh, energy intensive sectors and sectors with a lower energy intensity where I find uh, the strongest response is in sectors that are so-called demand sensitive. So these are sectors that produce more discretionary goods and services such as retail, hospitality, other types of private services. And these are also the sectors where low-income households are uh, disproportionately employed while they're actually underrepresented in sectors with a very high energy intensity. And this also helps reconcile this heterogeneity uh, in the income responses and illustrates that this policy not only transmits through these traditional cost push channel that people have in mind, but also through a demand side channel of the economy by uh, the general equilibrium effects of the policy on wages and also the extensive margin uh, on unemployment, which feeds back to households, which then again, lower their demand even further. What are the policy implications of all of this? Um, my results suggest that fiscal policies targeted to the most affected households may actually be able to help reduce the economic costs of climate change mitigation policies. To the extent that energy demand is inelastic, this should not compromise emission reductions to a significant extent. And in fact, energy demand turns out to be particularly inelastic for, for low-income households. And this is relevant also in the context of the EU ETS because uh, in the current system, uh, all these carbon revenues are actually, so there is no direct redistribution scheme in place that could offset these distributional effects that, that I document here. All these revenues, they're, they're earmarked for projects and investments to uh, innovating green technologies or to reduce carbon emissions even further. So to study the role of redistributing these carbon revenues more formally, I build a climate economy model to use as a laboratory. Because we are short on time, let me just give you a brief sketch of that model. I'm happy to answer uh, uh, or give you a bit more detail in the question time that will follow after the presentation. Uh, it is a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, um, features nominal rigidities to allow for these demand side effects that I've emphasized a household heterogeneity. On the supply side, there are two sectors. There is an energy sector that produces energy, which is isomorphic to emissions in that model using labor. And this sector will also be subject to a carbon tax, which is the main policy experiment that I consider in the model. And the non-energy sector, which consists of a continuum of new Keynesian firms that produce a consumption good using energy, labor, and capital as inputs. On the household side, uh, on the demand side, I have a model with household heterogeneity, but to keep the analysis tractable, I only consider an equilibrium with limited heterogeneity. So there are two types of households, uh, share of households are so-called hand-to-mouth households. So they just, if uh, 
paycheck to paycheck and consume all of their income plus any transfers that they may receive from the government and savers who choose their consumption intertemporally and are basically on their Euler equation. Uh, importantly, households differ along three key dimensions. They differ in their energy expenditure shares. So households actually consume a bundle of energy and non-energy goods. And I uh, calibrate these energy expenditure shares using the household uh, microdata. They differ in their income incidence and obviously in their marginal propensities to consume. There is also some notion of idiosyncratic risk, but uh, this will not play a crucial role for our purposes here. I calibrate this model to match uh, key micro and macro moments from the data. And it turns out that the model with these ingredients is actually able to generate um, responses that are in line with the empirical uh, magnitudes that I find both in absolute terms. This is already a result because uh, a model without this household heterogeneity couldn't generate these large responses that I find in the data without calibrating the energy expenditure shares to an implausibly high level. And also in relative terms, meaning like how important are these direct versus indirect effects that I uh, talked about before. And then the main experiment that I do in this model is basically if we start from a baseline case where all these revenues accrue to the uh, higher income savers, which I think is the empirically plausible case, what happens if we start redistributing some of these revenues also to uh, the lower income hand to mouth? And here, basically, the scenario is that uh, when re revenues are redistributed equally across society, so all these groups uh, get an equal share of these revenues. And we can see that by doing that, we can actually mitigate the aggregate uh, response of consumption by quite a bit. In PDV terms, it's by about 15%. This can be even uh, larger if we redistribute even more of the revenues in a more progressive fashion. And how does this work? By supporting the income of these lower, low income hand to mouth households. And because these households have a high MPC, this also helps to stabilize their consumption response to a significant extent. On the other hand, savers, they face a somewhat stronger fall in their incomes, but uh, because they choose their consumption temporarily, they kind of smooth this fall in their income better and the change in their consumption response is more muted. I think these uh, inequality implications are especially relevant given the recent situation on European carbon markets. Uh, prices are still at very high levels and uh, these distributional effects are really important, I believe, for policymakers to take into account because they could eventually threaten the public support of the policy. And in a democracy, we need public support for these policies to achieve the climate transition. And we have seen that this can be an impediment, for instance, because of the, for instance, the Gilets jaunes movement in France, which actually started as an opposition to higher gasoline taxes. And uh, what to do with, uh, with the revenues is, is relevant. I've illustrated this in, in this model, but we can also look at the data. So for instance, uh, a good, uh, case in point is actually the carbon tax in British Columbia, uh, which is designed in a very different way from the EU ETS, where they actually uh, redistribute all of the revenues in a very progressive fashion to uh, households and also small businesses. And there, the literature typically finds much smaller macroeconomic effects that I find for the EU ETS. So until now in this presentation, I've really focused on the short-term consequences of this policy. I've shown that the policy is successful at reducing emissions and it does so quite persistently, uh, but this comes at an economic cost that is distributed, unfortunately, quite unevenly. But now uh, let's look a bit beyond this short term. Uh, an often used argument for carbon prices is that it actually fosters directed technological change in green technologies in particular. And this is actually one of the main motivations for this emissions trading uh, system that the commission also put uh, forward in this way. And to analyze this, I use patent data from the European Patent Office. Uh, this allows me to study the effect on patenting in climate change mitigation technologies because conveniently the European Patent Office has developed a classification system that allows one to identify patents in this well. And the results are shown in this chart here. Um, here we can see 
the input responses again to a carbon policy shock normalized to increase the energy price by 1% on impact on the share of low carbon patents. And I have here two different measures. First one is constructed based on all patents. So this is the share of patents in climate change mitigation technologies relative to all patents filed at the European Patent Office. Uh, and on the right side here, I also have a version of that measure just screening on high value patents. So these are just patents that are filed at multiple exchanges. And this is a proxy that is commonly used in the literature uh, to identify higher value patents. And it turns out that there is actually a significant increase in the patenting activity in these green technologies. And this is really reassuring because that's really what's going to be key for the transition to a low carbon economy in the, in the long term, because this is what will allow us to reduce emissions permanently uh, without lowering output permanently as well. I do a bunch of robustness checks, which I'm very happy to talk more about if you're interested. Uh, this is an empirical paper, so you have to make sure that these results are robust uh, to uh, along many dimensions. All right, so I'm already at the end. I want to leave enough time for questions and discussion, so let me conclude. In this paper, I present new evidence on the economic consequences of carbon pricing using data from the European carbon market. Again, this is the largest carbon market in the world, and I think it is informative for the effects of carbon pricing uh, policies also in other places around the world. I find that the policy is successful in reducing emissions and also fosters green innovation, but this comes at an economic cost that is, uh, born, uh, that is not born equally across society. In fact, when we also account for these indirect effects by income and employment, policy turns out to be quite regressive. But on the upside, I also showed that uh, we actually have the tools to address this. So by redistributing some of the carbon revenues in a targeted way, we can actually reduce these costs and the inequality implications without compromising emission reductions to a significant extent. And this is because uh, energy demand is quite inelastic, particularly for low-income households. And these low-income households, they also only make up for a relatively small share of aggregate emissions. So we can compensate them without compromising the goal of reducing overall emissions. All right, thank you so much uh, for coming and for your attention. And I'm very happy uh, to engage in the discussion now and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah, but thank you very much for a very um, interesting presentation. There are quite a few questions uh, in the chat. So let me start with a comment and then a question um, by Adele Morris. Uh, the comment is, uh, Energy demand does not have to be inelastic as long as a carbon tax induces substitution to lower carbon forms of energy. Indeed, it is the shift in relative prices of different forms of energy that drives decarbonization the most, particularly in the power sector. This is a real relative price effect and not inflation. I will follow up this comment with a question of mine, but. Um, Adele's question is the following. How do you reconcile these results with those of Metcalf and Stock in their paper, the microeconomic impact of Europe's bar, uh, carbon taxes? They found no robust evidence of a negative effect of the European carbon tax on employment or GDP growth. Great, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And I completely agree. I think also uh, the emission reductions that we have observed over these 20, 20 years of the EU ETS, they were mainly driven actually by substituting, for instance, coal with gas fired electricity. Uh, so this plays an important role. What I meant, like the, that energy demand is analytic on the consumer side, is that this plays a role for the macroeconomic consequences because they, at least in the short run, are not able to substitute, especially uh, lower income households who cannot just like improve their energy efficiency in an easy way like affording a more efficient boiler, for instance, is very expensive. And maybe if you're renting, you also have limited power over that. So that's basically what I meant. So that's why they're faced with a reduction in their disposable income after the increase in the energy price. And this leads to this first round of effects, which then uh, kicks in this second round of demand effects that I also discussed in the presentation. Now, with regards to the difference to Metcalf and Stock, that's an excellent comment. So there are a few papers that study basically the effects of carbon pricing policies on the macroeconomy. Uh, 
Medical and Stock is another one, and they look at European carbon taxes. So it's a different system. So the UHS includes the power sector and heavy emitting is Austria sectors. These European carbon taxes, they mostly include sectors that are not covered in the EU ETS. And I think one explanation could be that uh, the power sector plays such a crucial role because they pass on these costs to higher energy prices. And basically this, uh, uh, this, this initiates this, this whole chain of effects that I discussed today. And another crucial uh, aspect is how are the revenues used? Because a lot of the European carbon taxes they were part of a broader tax reform. So for instance, they cut income taxes in certain tax brackets at the same time. Uh, so this kind of confounds maybe the effect of the carbon tax with also these changes in the income tax. Here in the EU ETS, as I've discussed, there is no such direct redistribution scheme for households that could alleviate these consequences. So this could be another explanation why my results are different from there. Um, I would like to ask a question. Um, you are assuming a decrease in household income across all um, income groups. So the question is the following, um, such a decrease in income, wouldn't it exert uh, some type of downward pressure on non-energy prices? And if that's the case, wouldn't then the effect uh, on inflation be slightly more ambiguous? Excellent, yeah. So that, that's a very good point. And I've looked at this as well. And in fact, my results are consistent with that narrative because what I've shown you in the presentation today is the response of energy, consumer prices and headline. And these are both very significant, but I've also looked at core consumer prices. So excluding energy and food. And here, basically the response is much more muted. So we find a bit of an increase in the short term but it's not very significantly estimated. But then especially uh, a couple of years out when also these aggregate demand effects start to kick in and weigh down uh, on, uh, on prices in, in non-energy categories, uh, we also find this basically in the core measure where we basically find, don't find an increase anymore at these horizons. So this is really a shock to relative prices. So it leads to an increase in energy price inflation, this uh, translates to headline where energy is a significant component, but we don't find such a strong increase in core, at least for the sample that I've studied here. Thank you. Um, and I think that's also consistent with, for instance, there is another study by Beatrice Vedder di Mauro and Maximilian Conrad, and they also find limited effects uh, on, on core consumer prices. Thank you, Diego. Let me go to some more questions. Um, so uh, Marisa Montes de Oca is asking, how do these results compare or reconcile to those that find that the fiscal multipliers of carbon taxes are mm. much smaller than the fiscal multipliers of, for example, labor taxes? That's a... Uh... That's a good question. Yeah, so it really depends of the income incidence of a particular policy, and also with carbon taxes, there it depends a lot. So what 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 to do? What what is being done with the revenues? Uh, so and what I estimate here for the EU ETS is that the incidence uh, falls disproportionately on these low-income households, and these households also turn out to have uh, very high marginal propensities to consume, and this helps to reconcile these large uh, large uh, multiplier effects that I find. Now, this depends obviously from policy to policy. It turns out to be large in this context here, maybe different in other contexts. Um, one other question. Um, on, in your paper, you are assuming that monetary policy remains rather neutral. They are observing the increase in prices, but there is no action. So, um, Let's assume that what you're describing is taking place against a background of loose monetary conditions. What is the role that uh, monetary policy should play in this um, case? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. So, so that's right. So in, in the data, I find not much of a monetary policy reaction. Uh, so the, the policy rate doesn't respond significantly. Um, and uh, yeah, also, so and, and that, that's actually important because also what I find is, okay, the policy 
does not only uh, transmit to this traditional cost push channel, but also through this demand side channel. And obviously, if you also have that, the monetary policy implications may be different because maybe monetary policy doesn't want to do a lot about supply shocks because it because it can't. And this is like an efficient response of the economy to these changes in supply. But if there is something wrong with demand, monetary policy can help by by playing a stabilizing role. So I think it would be interesting to analyze this in more detail and basically. In my framework, this would suggest that if monetary policy was more active, it could probably stabilize some of these demand side effects that I've emphasized here in this context. And, and the, the effects of these policies on the macroeconomy could be uh, could be dampened as well. And in fact, uh, in the model, I can do some experiments like that. And one thing that I did, for instance, is if you look at the relevant uh, target in the Taylor rule, so in the baseline case, I actually use headline inflation as the relevant inflation measure. If you change that to core, meaning that monetary policy uh, won't respond as much to this uh, initial increase in energy price inflation and thus headline inflation, the macroeconomic consequences actually get dampened quite a bit. Thank you. Um, one more question from the audience. Uh, that's from uh, Andreas uh, Breitenfellner. Does a carbon tax have an impact on prime en energy prices, crude, et cetera? Excellent. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, and that, that's the case because exactly what we talked about before, there, there are these substitution effects which then also put uh, upward pressure on other sources of energy. And I do find that uh, these carbon policy shock also have, for instance, a significant effect uh, on the price of oil. So for instance, uh, the Brent or WTI price. Um, and actually, that's also interesting if we like think about the comparison of these carbon policy shocks or oil price shocks more broadly, because this is also a question that I got some get sometimes. Uh, so is this just comparable to an oil price shocks? And we know how how they affect the economy. And and the question is yes and no because it's true like the uh, energy prices play a crucial role in transmission. So we would expect okay if there is an energy price increase driven by by an oil price shock to have similar effects. Ex ante, and I also because I've also worked on oil price shocks before, I've compared this and I find in many macro aggregates uh, some similarities of the responses, but there are two crucial differences. So after uh, the carbon policy shock, I find uh, a decrease in emissions that is more persistent and more pronounced than after the oil price shocks. And the most uh, important uh, difference is actually when I look at the impact on green innovation, because there I found this significant uptick after the carbon policy shock, but not after the oil price shock. And this is actually consistent also with some theoretical literature that shows that oil price shocks, they also create an incentive to innovate in brown technology. So there is some crowding out from green innovation, whereas uh, carbon policy shocks, they create a specific incentive to innovate in green technology. That's great. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, Diego, thank you very much for a very um, interesting uh, presentation and discussion. I uh, would also like to thank our audience uh, for joining us today uh, and also remind you that our next uh, webinar will be on April 11th. The uh, speaker will be um, Miles Parker and who will present um, his paper, uh, Feeling the Heat, Extreme Temperatures and um, Price Stability. I hope to see you all then. Thank you very much again. And bye-bye. Um, thanks so much, Anastasia, again, for having me. And thanks, Thank everyone, you. for coming and for all your questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.